Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Dr. Thomas Hemingway here. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss out. You are now listening to the Unshakable Health Podcast with Dr. Thomas Hemingway. All right. Oh my gosh, guys. This is an amazing week. If you're catching this right now, I am live in Florida, or as the song goes, Florida. <laughs> Shout out to that <laughs> from back in the day. Some of you will remember that. <laughs> Florida, I am there live speaking at the Align Limitless event today with this podcast release on an amazing new topic that I have not specifically shared before on how to have unlimited or limitless energy zest, vitality, chutzpah, that just life force that'll keep and propel you forward to crush life, to accomplish your ikigai or your mission, your purpose. And I'm sharing all about that today, live in Tampa, Florida. And if you're not there with me so I can give you that hug, I can give you a virtual hug if you pick up that ticket to grab this event, Align Limitless, the virtual uh, recorded version. You can watch it from the comforts of your own home. So don't despair if you didn't make it out to sunny Florida and soak up those vitamin D rays with me. You can still grab the content with me and the 20 other amazing speakers at this Align Limitless event. Please go to aligneventslive.com or hop on over to my website, thomashemingway.com or my wife's website, brookhemingway.com to get all the information on how to get yourself a copy of this amazing event. You will be blown away at this content. It's, oh my gosh, it's unfolding live right now and it is just so incredible. You'll definitely want to have the recording so you'll be able to pick that up and ha, ah, you're going to be so glad you did. And for now, I just want to take a moment to thank you for sharing a bit of your day with us and just being able to participate in this beautiful thing we call life and growth and education and all the things we share here on this holistic, natural health podcast that is Unshakable Health. And I just want you to know I appreciate you. And I just love, love, love that you are here with us. And so I thank you. And I would ask you to please continue to listen, to share these episodes, to subscribe so you never miss out, and to drop a review. I read every single one of those reviews. They tickle my heart. They keep me going. They keep me propelled with that same vitality, energy, and chutzpah that keeps me going. They make me smile. In fact, I'm going to share with you a recent interview entitled Phenomenal Five Stars. This podcast is really phenomenal. It came from Molly Mack. She says, the mixture of science and practical tips that Dr. Hemingway delivers is so valuable. I highly recommend it. I'm excited to dive into more and more episodes. Be ready to take notes because it's chocked full of delicious goodies. And she drops five stars in this beautiful review. Molly Mack, thank you so much for dropping that review. And hey, you guys could get on the air here too. I will share your words. I just love, love, love to read the comments. So thank you. And thank you for following at DR Thomas Hemingway on Instagram and thomashemingway.com. All things Thomas Hemingway on the web and Facebook and all of that, because then you will never miss the upcoming content. And right now today, we're going to get into an amazing episode with Dr. Mindy Peltz, who is an expert at all things holistic health. Specifically, she loves talking about fasting. In fact, she has a best-selling book that's just out and it's called Fast Like a Girl. And she is incredible. She talks about how there's some nuance to intermittent fasting, especially with respect to women. And you want to pay attention to it because she talks about hormonal health. She talks about time of the month and how that relates to fasting. She talks about all things fasting. She is just a wealth of information. I'm so excited to have her on the show this week, DrMindyPeltz.com. So let's not delay. Let's get into it. Dr. Mindy Peltz, here we go. All right. We, we are so excited today. We have a wonderful guest who is just expert in all things fasting, all things women's health. She is amazing. Dr. Mindy Peltz is here today on the show. Welcome, Dr. Mindy. How are you? I'm amazing. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh my gosh. The pleasure is mine, as they say. I'm so grateful to have you on today. I've just been so eager to have this conversation because you may or may not know this, but most of my listeners are women and mm. they love these topics about mm. fasting, about women's health, about the hormonal balance and, and where to fit in this fasting thing anyway. And yeah. I just love to kind of get a background on you, Dr. Mindy. Tell us why and when and how you got interested in fasting in the first place. Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And before I do that, I just want to say thank you for bringing these topics to women because I do, you know, believe that 
women's health, the approach to women's health needs to be different on all levels, not just fasting. Um, so I love that you're starting these conversations. So thank you for doing that. Awesome. Um, so yeah, you know, it's interesting. So my background is as a chiropractor and for years, you know, the, the premise of chiropractic is the body heals itself. I think that's just like so core to our belief system and that it's physical, emotional, uh, and chemical interferences that slow that healing down. So everything I do comes from the idea that the body's perfect. You just have to remove interferences. I, I flip and love that. Thought. So <laughs> I love that. I love that. Stay I, out of the way. The body knows how to do it. We just got to give it what it needs. <laughs> exactly. And so with that in mind, what I started to see in my clinic was that somewhere around 15 years ago, the body was not healing the way it used to heal. And it didn't matter, you know, what modality I threw at it, didn't matter what supplement I gave it. It just seemed like it didn't really heal in the same way. So I started to go down rabbit holes of like, okay, what is the body going through? And that's when you have to, you know, if you, once you open up that question, you start to see that we are living in the most toxic time in human history. And even like getting my patients to eat normal was really difficult or eat healthy was really difficult because it's a war zone going into your grocery store. Like there's so many chemicals, there's so much, the labels are mysterious. And so I kept trying to manipulate nutrition with them. And all of a sudden, one day I came across Dr. Osumi, Osumi's uh, research on autophagy. And if you're not familiar with that, he was, uh, he discovered autophagy and in 2015, 2016, he was given a Nobel prize in medicine and physiology for this concept that without food, the cells turn within and they start to repair themselves. And so I watched that and I was like, okay, this is really interesting. Well, I bet they're going to try to come up with a drug that <laughs> like, you know, they can put out there that can stimulate autophagy. Well, sure enough, they tried they couldn't find that drug and hence the whole fasting movement was, was born. And so I, you know, dove into fasting and discovered that everything I was trying to achieve for my patients, everything I was trying to achieve for myself could be, was happening so much quicker if we started to bring intermittent fasting into their protocols, like bodies were healing like from a variety of conditions. So that really launched my obsession. And then I took, I took all of the information I learned, brought it to my YouTube channel and my YouTube channel took off and exploded. But what was cool about that is everybody gave me their stories of like, Hey, I got off this medication. I did this and I did that. And I tried this fast that you said, and this happened. And it, it, it literally blew me away. Like in one year's time, I'm, I, I had hundreds and thousands of comments and stories on, on my social media about how fasting healed the body. And I was hooked at that point. Wow. That's incredible. And I, it, it's interesting because it's one of those things that I think we kind of as humans knew was good for us. Right. I mean, even <sighs> millennia ago, we didn't eat 16 to 24 hours a day. Like we do now, I think the average American eats almost 16 hours out of the day. Like, yeah. holy it's moly, crazy. we're eating every waking moment. We're alive. You know, yeah. if, if our eyes are open, we're eating, our mouths are open. And that, that's just so not yeah. the way it was planned. Yeah. And now that we have, like you said, all this research behind it, for me, that's just, it puts the sparkle in my eye. It just makes me excited to share because I think any of us that have tried it, you know, we feel great when we do it. We just feel amazing. The body is more alive and vibrant. And we have that sort of extra zest, you know, the brain derived neurotrophic factor goes through the roof and we just feel more alert and awake and energized and all those amazing things. But I think the cool thing about your experience is that I feel like you've done it, not only many different varieties yourself, because I've heard you talk about prolonged fasting. And then of course the the intermittent fasting, the variety that most people think about, right? The time-restricted feeding. I think that's kind of the one that comes to mind. Do you have a favorite approach of all those that are out there or, or what, yeah. what do you lean towards? It's, it, it's like trying to pick a favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little hard, but what, you know, uh, what I, what I've done and, and I mapped this out in my new book, fast, like a girl is that I really looked at what were, what, what's the science saying 
And then I've played for the last several years with what this science is saying to apply it to all these people uh, on my social. And I've come up with six different lengths, everything from 13 hours to 24 or to 72 hour length fast. And there are six different moments in that in that journey from like 13 to 72, you know, all the way to that three day that different healing switches get turned on. So in order to answer that question, I think it really depends on what healing I'm trying to create. I would say for me, normally I 17 hours, which is where autophagy starts to kick in. I'm pretty good with that on a regular basis. I love 24 hour fast because you can heal the gut really well. Um, so I play personally between 17 and 24, and then I'll throw like a three day water fast at my body a couple times a year. Um, so they all have benefit, but I would say the most regular one I do is somewhere between 17 and 24. Awesome. And so when you're doing that, you're not doing that every single day, seven days a week, right? You're adjusting that to your current needs. I know yeah. um, women specifically, if they're still menstruating, should definitely kind of change things up a bit, depending on what phase of the cycle they're in. Yeah. Um, maybe you can speak to that a little bit, help us. Cause I, I've seen just so many women that, that try intermittent fasting and like, you know, they're so gung ho, they want to just go after it and they want to yeah you know, crush the 16, 18, you know, 20 hours, do the OMAD, whatever it is. And they start doing this day after day. And they're like, what the heck? This is a little bit, you know, especially if they're still ovulating, it's just not quite working if they do it every single day. So maybe give us a little bit of an approach, how you would adjust that for somebody who's still ovulating, menstruating and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, it, it's such a good point. And this is what came I came away from watching all these people leave their fasting stories on social is that the women had very clear uh, side effects that the men didn't have. And the thing to think about is let's bring it back down to hormones. So you guys are driven really by one hormone, although two, two come to play. You're driven by testosterone and you have a little bit, you also have a estrogen in your body. Mm -hmm. Testosterone actually, what's interesting about testosterone is it's produced around the, uh, in the cells around the testes and goes up to the, uh, once production happens, it goes up into the brain and it turns to estrogen. So you really, when it comes to fasting, you only have to think about testosterone and testosterone shines. It yeah. shines with fasting, like 1300% increase in testosterone. If you fast for fi about 15 hours, 2000% increase if you go 24 hours. So testosterone loves when we fast. For women, we have three very prominent hormones. We have estrogen, we have testosterone, and we have progesterone. So estrogen, if she could talk to us, she would say, keep your carbs down, stimulate autophagy, don't let insulin get out of control. And so, and if you do that, I will show up for you every month. And if you're a menstruating woman, she's making her debut for you. She's coming in every month, somewhere between day one and about day 10, day 11. She'll peak about day 12 of your, of your cycle. So any fasting you do, any low carb, any keto that's done in that front half of the cycle is going to rock for you. Now, testosterone, we only get testosterone in one little short <laughs> window, which blows me away if you think about it. Um, but we get it in ovulation between day 10 and day 15. So you can do some fast in the middle of ovulation. There's a few, a few nuances there. But here's the here's the here's the the rub, and this is where it gets really crazy for women. Is as we move into the back half of our cycle, progesterone actually wants glucose to be higher. We are intelligent bodies actually become more insulin resistant as we move closer to that last week of our cycle, which we all know is like the PMS week. <laughs> but what's crazy? This is the, like once I got a hold of this and thought about this, I was like, the body's so brilliant. You, I could put a thousand women in one room and they would all tell you week before my period, I crave carbs. Okay. Well, why do you crave carbs? Because progesterone demands it. So your intelligent body increases your cravings and it also, you become kind of a little bit more lethargic because progesterone wants you to chill out because if cortisol goes high, you're now going to tank progesterone. 
So fasting is going to raise cortisol a bit, just like exercise does, Mm -hmm. and it lowers glucose. So it is a horrible thing to do the week before your period. So for a menstruating woman, she's got to cycle that throughout her, her menstrual cycle, which is why, you know, that the fast like a girl would be the first book to show these six different fasts and how to time them to a cycle. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And I've, I found that to be my experience working with many over the years as well. And what would you say? I sort of always tell them, I'll just tell you what I, what I tell the women that are still menstruating and ovulating, et cetera. But during that back half of the period, you know, the last week or so before they have their menses, I typically tell them don't go for any records. If you want to do a 12 hour or 13 hour overnight, what I call a circadian fast, that's perfectly fine, but don't be pushing your body to try to, you know, really extend your windows during that last week. You're going to hate, you're going to hate yeah. it. Number one, you're going to feel crappy. You're going to, yeah. you know, be craving the, the carbs and things like that. It's just not ideal timing. And I feel like that's worked okay for, for, for the majority. I feel like just about anybody can still do like a 12 hour, 13 hour overnight circadian fast. Have you found that to be the case? Do you like hackers? I certainly don't. I hate them. I just can't stand even the thought of being hacked at the airport or any other place where you use public Wi-Fi. And so I have joined ExpressVPN and you should too. And if you use my code at expressvpn.com forward slash Dr. Thomas, that's D-R-T-H-O-M-A-S, you will get three months for free. So why stress about the hackers? Why stress about using airport Wi-Fi? I don't. I don't any longer. In fact, I use airport Wi-Fi all the time because I'm protected at ExpressVPN. So check it out. ExpressVPN.com forward slash Dr. Thomas for three months free. If they know how to fast well, that will work. But what I've discovered is that if you're stepping into fasting, and you've mm-hmm. never done it before, a, even a 12 hour fast, if you've only gone eight hours, will raise yeah. cortisol. So once you, get, I call it once you're fat adapted, once you can mm-hmm. move in and out of like sugar burner and fat burner really easily, you can use those two metabolic systems, then yeah, a 12 hour fast is will be fine for a woman the week before her cycle. But if you're listening to this, you've never fasted and you're like, oh, well, geez, I've been going eight hours. Let me try to go 12 and you're on day 22 of your cycle, you're going to think fasting is the worst thing ever. You're going to be hungry. You're going to, you're, you're not going to, you're, you're going to mess up your cycle. Like, so for the advanced faster, yes. For the new faster, no. Yeah, no, I I would agree with that because I think once you're flexible, metabolically flexible, you can easily switch on and off, whether you're going to burn you know, the fats during, during the fasting period, or if you're having, you know, like you said, towards the end of the cycle, you're having more, more carbs, you can switch over and burn the carbs and, mm-hmm. and it's, it seems pretty seamless, but yeah, if you've never fasted eight hours, like you start with that, just start with the, the time that hopefully yeah. you're sleeping because we yeah. would love everybody to get seven to eight hours of sleep. And then just kind of gradually extend that on either side of the window. And then once yeah. you're fat adapted or metabolically flexible, like you're saying, I would agree that Typically a 12 hour, I think almost anybody should be able to do a 12 hour any time of the month. And yeah. then of course the first, the first half is when you really want to go for your longer windows. Yeah. Um, at least that's been yeah. my experience. And what I did, what I did in fast, like a girl is I created a pre reset. Like I call it a, I created a 30 day fasting reset for women. And I created a prep, like where a couple of weeks you warm up. And then I give like a beginner example of what you would do for 30 days. And then it advanced. And I think it's the best way, like to think about this, which is there is some prep work. If you've never fasted, let's get some stabilization of your blood, uh, of your blood sugar. Let's, and then you slowly start to move your, your breakfast back an hour. And then, uh, you know, your first ledge is to get into that 12, 13 hour spot. Now, if you haven't even done that, like that sounds daunting, then definitely don't do this the week before your period. You'll, you'll find it so much easier to do it that once your period starts. Yeah, totally. That once you're starting the menses in that first week, that's that's when you're going to have the most likely chance of having success at extending those that's those right. windows. When you when you do um you know, shoot for these longer duration like you're talking 24, 48, 36 hour fast, how do you know you're ready to try something a little bit longer like that? What what yeah. are the indicators that you would usually share with people? 
If it's a great question, if you can get to somewhere, if you can pretty effortlessly get into the 20 hour mark, 24 hour mark, like you, that like down to, we call them one meal a day, or yeah. I call them the O matters um, yeah. because they get the, it's called OMAD one meal a day abbreviation. And so the O matters are often, um, you know, the ones that they become obsessive about and they stick to, I'm only eat one meal a day, but once you can get to one meal a day and you're like, Hey, that wasn't bad then you're ready. You can do a three-day water fast. So now you could do a three, your body knows. Let's, let's go, yeah. let's, let's like separate out the mind from the body. Your, your body could do it. Like I've watched miracles happen in three to five days where people just were sick. And then they do a th- five-day water fast and, and like the whole innate intelligence shifts. And that's the most beautiful thing. And those people, that would be what I would call like therapeutic fasting. Those people maybe didn't train themselves. But if we're looking at like longevity, if we're looking at like unsticking our weight loss resistance, um, just prevention in general, once you hit 24 hours, you're ready to go. You can you can dive in after that to longer ones. And you were saying that you try to do a longer one a couple of times a year. Is that yeah. kind of, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I would, yeah, I wouldn't want to do it every month or something. That'd be no. a little bit too much, I would think. So, okay. That makes sense. I usually do it two times a year. I do it January and September. And what the, here's the interesting thing about fasting for both men and women is when you go into those three day water fasts, what you're doing is you're getting rid of what we call senescent cells. And senescent cells are like dysfunctional aging cells and they don't bring in nutrients like they used to. They can't get toxins out of them um, and they're aging you quicker. Uh, Those senescent cells can also turn into cancer cells. So what what I like to do for my body is twice a year, let's shed these cells, like let's get them off. And that is, and then there's a spiritual, I, I believe there's this sort of insight insight that you get and you go in these longer fasts. So there's also sort of a, a spiritual, regardless of what your spiritual background is, there's some kind of really cool cosmic experience that happens in those longer fasts that you don't get in the shorter ones. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. And I think the cool thing with not only the longer fast, but just fasting in general, is it kind of gives you time to do other things with, you know, let your mind wander, focus on other things. Cause you're not thinking about food or as far as making right. it, preparing it, buying it, cleaning up after it, like right. all of those things are off the table and all of a sudden you're freed up to have other experiences. And e- even more so when you fast a longer time yeah. frame, like you said, up to a 72 hour, which are you using electrolytes during that or what? what yeah, are you just, you, okay. Yes. And I would say that's one of those ones where for women, for sure, um, the, and here's the reason why is that we have to really understand that, uh, we are not getting the same nutrient value in our foods unless you're consciously eating from a regenerative farm. But, um, even going into whole foods, you know, I know buying a, a food from a commercial farm is most likely been monocropped and those soils are deficient of nutrients. So one of the big things I saw in women when I when we were looking at what the results they were getting with fasting were is that this mineral deficiency revealed itself. So when you're not eating any food, you're getting even less minerals. So adding some electrolytes in makes the whole fasting experience is so much easier, so much easier. But then it you know fasting's like a mirror, so If you're in the second day of a water fast, you put some minerals in your water and you're like, oh, I feel so much better. Then I'm here to tell you, you need to add minerals back into your diet when you, when you go back to food, it's, it's a beautiful way to kind of see what you need, but minerals are definitely key to that. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. In fact, the more I looked into that, it's interesting to, to note that even as early as 1936, there were lots of reports on the soil and the mineral deficiencies that were evident back then, nearly a hundred years ago. And yet you and I know that not a lot has been done. Yes, there are some regenerative farms and that's amazing, but the quantity of them or percentage, I should say, is far, far, far too low when we consider all the farms that are out there. And so we do need additional 
electrolytes, minerals, you know, these kinds of things. We just can't get them. My favorite, and I, I think I've heard you speak to this as well. My favorite is magnesium. I mean, almost oh, all of us are deficient, at least functionally yeah. deficient yeah. in magnesium, which is literally the heart and soul of our metabolism. I mean, we can't yeah. even make energy. We can't make ATP without magnesium. No, no. I mean, and so you crucial. Can't- you can't make hormones specifically progesterone without magnesium for, so for women, magnesium is even more important. Um, uh, and I a thousand percent agree with you. Like if, if there was one mineral, I think everybody should dose on its magnesium, but women even more. And the second one, and I, I I'm curious your thoughts on this. The second one I would say is zinc. Yeah. That yeah. zinc, because, and primarily I'm looking at it through a hormonal lens. You need zinc to make uh, testosterone, you yes. need to make estrogen. So if you look at magnesium for progesterone, estrogen and testosterone really need that zinc. Yeah, no. And I always, especially when I'm talking to a guy, I'm like, dude, you got to get your, <laughs> your yeah. zinc up there too, because it's been proven to help with testosterone. I mean, yeah. zinc also vitamin D when, when oh, mixed but, yeah. of course with magnesium together. I mean, that's like, yeah. Great. Well, That's so, awesome. Yeah. So here's my thing on vitamin D that I geek out on. The way I look at vitamin D is it's like a little boat for your hormones. So if you're like all into creating, like, let's say you're taking magnesium and zinc because you want your body to be able to create more of these hormones, um, it still has to be carried through the system. And if you're low in vitamin D, you have no boat to carry the hormones to all the different parts of your body that need it. So yeah, it's the synergistic part of connecting back to something as, as primal as these darn nutrients we're supposed to be getting. And we don't get them because the soils are bad. The stressors are high. Toxic load is high. So the body's using them all the time. Yeah, no, couldn't agree more, especially with the vitamin D. And most people don't even think about, you know, they think, okay, well, maybe I can get it from the sun, but most people aren't. I mean, if you look at the data, most people are not getting outside. They're just not doing it. Yeah. I mean, Forget even prior to COVID, we still weren't getting outside yeah. like we really should be. Yeah. And so, and do you know on that one that if you live in a city with air pollution, that there, um, you know, that particle uh, PM two point five that shows up in air pollution actually mm-hmm. blocks the UVB rays that are going to go into your skin and give you and give you vitamin D. So vitamin D is you know very complicated. It's not as simple as let's take some supplements or get out into the sun. There's a lot. I, I mean, we have. We have watched, we've thrown vitamin D at so many people only to see nothing change. And then you've got to find a new way of what's blocking it. We're back at interference. What's blocking it from getting into the cells. Yeah, no, that's, it's so critical. And you got to think about the K2 as well. And if you're trying to get it from your nutrients, you got to get the highest quality, especially if you're looking at protein sources, for example, because it's not only what you eat, but what they eat or what they were exposed to as well both plant and animal, the way they were raised, it's so critical. And we, we don't think about it often enough, but thankfully I think the, the, the swell is changing a little bit. The tide is turning. People are starting to vote with their feet or their wallets. And I'm seeing more and more things available, which is just awesome to see because it's been too long. And I think if we keep that trajectory and we refuse to buy the lower end, you know, poor quality stuff, people are going to have to start doing regenerative farming in in much more higher magnitude. So Yeah, that, that's one thing I think that when you mentioned this uh, business about uh, all of the stressors and the toxins that are out there, are there any, um, so I think we all sort of know about the plastics and how they can be xenoestrogens and things like that. When you, when you think of those that can be disruptors, both, you know, endocrine disruptors, as well as with the steroid hormones that are out there, be it the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, what are the things that you think of as the most common offenders as far as toxins with respect to these? Well, I, again, now we can kind of go back to like the differences between men and women. So, you know, for women, our flipping beauty products, like, you know, and there's a, thank God there's a lot of new, new beauty, you know, natural beauty products. So I would say for women, it's what we put on our skin. I mean, um, that would be a big one. Um, uh, men put stuff on their skin and hair too, but women uh, there's, you know, statistics on it's like 10 times the amount that women put on, um, but, uh, pesticides, pesticides are a crazy endocrine disruptor that we're all exposed to. And if you're going out to eat, if uh, unless the restaurants all organic, you're getting pesticides. 
Um, I think glyphosate is one of the most dangerous chemicals we have in our environment right now because it drives all the other toxins deeper into our brain. Um, and then of course we have plastics, but how do you get away from plastics? So all of those are like daily exposures that we're getting and we may not know, but I think the, the, the toxin that's the biggest endocrine disruptor the, or category of toxins that destroys people's hormonal health more than anything are heavy metals, lead, mercury, thallium, cesium, um, aluminum, these are, these don't get rid, they're not, they don't exit the body very well. So if we go back to the concepts around the, these senescent cells that you get rid of when you fast, I believe we're, we're definitely getting the pesticides and endic beauty products and glyphosate plastics. Those are going to exit when you go into a state of autophagy heavy metals, what happens is the body doesn't know how to get rid of it. So when the cell dies, those heavy metals get, get redistributed and usually they'll go up into the brain. So the heavy metals are the one that are the most stubborn and need a different approach. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and what you just mentioned with respect to fasting, a lot of these tend to be sort of stored, if you will, in, in the fat cells primarily. And when you do get into a prolonged fast, for example, you are burning the fat. And so you do naturally have more of these toxins released. So that's definitely something both a good thing because we want to get rid of them, but we need to expect it as well. Cause sometimes you'll get some, some issues during that acute phase. Speak to, you were, you were talking about, um, the toxins, especially the heavy metals, what other approaches are you talking about? Chelation or what, what, what other, um, avenues yeah, you, you need a binder, to? you need a binder of some kind. Um, so what we do, like if we take, put it in the context of fasting, um, if we know you're going to go into 17 hours or more and you have a heavy metal load, then you're going to want to put some binders in there and activated charcoal, uh, will bind in the gut. Um, which is great, but then what are you going to bind in the brain? And that's where you need something like EDTA or a zeolite of some kind. Um, so the, it, we, yeah, you play with binders for sure. And then the other piece is making sure your lymph pathways are open. One of, one of the things that was so interesting to me when we first started to watch millions of people fast was that there was a subset of people that actually gained weight when they fasted. And it didn't really make sense to me. But then I realized what was happened is the body was trying to get rid of all of these toxins, but the pathways that were, there was like a traffic jam of lymph and there was tightness in the fascia. And, the, and so they couldn't get out of the body. So it held, the body held on to it. And that is, you know, one of the another nuance for fasting and just detoxing in general, let's make sure your natural pathways are open. And in, in the book, I put a bunch of things in there about how do we go about it? Because it's not as simple as dry brushing. Um, you got to, there's got to be a whole strategy around your pathways. Yeah, no, for sure. And I actually, it was, I had an interesting discussion recently with uh, Nadine Artemis. I think you probably know her, mm -hmm. but she's great at all these natural techniques. And we talked about just like, you know, the brain has its uh, own lymphatic system called the glymphatic system, which was, I think one of the coolest discoveries in the last 10, I think it was about 10 years ago, 2012 yeah. out of the university of Rochester, but also the teeth have their own sort of micro uh, lymphatic uh, nature as well. And, and the skin does as well. I mean, we, we have these lymphatic systems everywhere in our body, which are supposed to help us get rid of the toxins, like you right. said. Right. And, and if we're not, if they're plugged up or they're jammed up because of one thing or another, we, we're not effectively going to be able to release them. That'll increase the oncotic pressure. You'll get swollen or edema as we call it. And and, and see that weight gain that you're talking about. So what, what's a couple of things that, that our folks that are listening right now can do to help make sure these pathways are open, if you will, the lymphatic vessels. Yeah. And, and, um, to your point on the lymphatic system, you know, this is whenever, like you doubt your body, think about how flipping cool this is your brain actually shrinks at night so that all of that, that the cerebral spinal fluid can go up and wash those toxins away. Like it's a bath. That, it takes a bath. It, it detoxes at night. It's so cool. Like I just love what the body is capable of. So, um, you know, sweating's the first one. Are you sweating on a regular basis? Cause that's how your body gets rid of stuff. 
Um, breathing is, you know, are you doing, I think all this, the, the new insight on breath work is incredible. And so are you doing like some of the, whatever your breathing style is, you know, D, the Wim Hof breathing or, you know, Tony Robbins used to have that, that in and out really fast cut through the nose, but you definitely, or if you go and work out, you could do both of those. You could, you know, push yourself in a workout and you're sweating and you're having to breathe hard. You're detoxing. So those would be, you know, and movement in general, like, are you moving to your point about we're inside all the time? Are we moving? So those, those are really easy. And then outside of that, we've got dry brushing, which is great. It's not, it's a, it's a piece, uh, castor oil packs. We do a ton of that in our, in, within our community, uh, coffee enemas are amazing. Uh, they sound horrible at the beginning, but then after you've tried one or you see one, it works, it's really, really good. So, um, so yeah, you know, there, there are a lot of strategies and, and here's the thing that I think is so interesting is that. We really want, like, give me the one thing, give me the two <laughs> things. And you, one of the things I did in Fast Like a Girl is I put a, a list of like, here are all the different ways you can detox because you might do really well with castor oil pack, whereas I need to detox my lungs and go into some rapid breathing. We just don't know where it's getting stuck. Yeah, no, all those, all the things, all the things, right? That make yeah. you breathe hard, that make you sweat. Are you into yeah. sauna? Do you do sauna? Sauna is great. Hot, yeah. Cold or um, I think saunas, but it has to be infrared because infrared is different than your gym sauna mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's heating the cell from the inside out and it's pushing out like a fever. It's like inducing a fever. Um, so yeah, sauna is great as well. Love saunas. Yeah. I wish, I wish I had one when I, my, my parents have one of those infrared saunas and I get in that thing every chance I get. And I just feel amazing afterwards. <laughs> right. Maybe I'll get one of those little, like, you know, backpack varieties that I can just roll out and get in. And, you know, the, the small portable ones. That, that, there's, uh, those are good. Those are good. There's nothing like the ones you sit in, but, they're, yeah. but the cost differential is quite huge. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. So, so sweating, breathing hard. And I would agree any, any technique that works for you, there's so many different varieties. I, I like to tell people that your whole state can be changed in six breaths, you know, in one minute, basically you can do the, the box breathing, you can do whatever technique and literally you can go from like stressed out and just, ah, and six breaths away and you're in your Zen time almost. I mean, it can right. be that fast. That's what I love about breathing. It's so quick. It's so, so quick. rapid. It's, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. What one thing that came to mind when you were speaking to um, sweating and breathing hard is a lot of people have questions about when they are fasting, speak to the, should I do a fasted workout? Should I not? How do I know I'm ready for that? When's the right time for that? Just speak to the fasted workout a little bit, if you uh, don't mind. That's, this is such a good question. Thank you for asking me. Um, here's the thing. Again, you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to accomplish in your workout? So one of the things we know, and this has been one of my fasting hacks that has worked so well for our community, for both men and women, is that when you work out, you are stimulating autophagy, whether you really realize it or not. Now, certain workouts like HIIT training, where your heart rate's going up and down over a period of time stimulates more autophagy, really, really heavy weights like done very slowly stimulates autophagy. And what it's doing when you work out, when you're, when you're stimulating autophagy is you're really cleaning those muscles up. You're really like getting extra glucose to be released from, from the muscles and the muscles, the cellular, on a cellular level are repairing. So if you go in, in a fasted state, you're going to repair and clean those muscles up even better. So, whereas if you are eating what you're bought before you go in, your body's going to use the glucose that you just ate for fuel in the workout. Whereas if you go in fasted, now the body is going to have to rely on what it stored years ago to break it down and build itself up stronger. So for me, I love fasted workouts. I can't do it any other way. Now, the, here's the trick because we I've debated this with so many uh, health experts is that when you are done fasting what and working out, what do you do then? And that's where you want to come in strong with like protein because mm -hmm. there are amino acid sensors in the muscles that when you bring in 30 grams of protein, what happens is you stimulate mTOR and mTOR is growth. So it would be a little bit like somebody coming in and like 
cleaning out your kitchen and then you want to come in afterwards and reorganize it and and put some new uh, appliances and things in a in a new place. So it's you're you're really I love the fasted workout because you maximize the body's ability to clean itself up. Just make sure you eat afterwards and you do a recovery with food. Yeah, and and the I always say prioritize your protein. I mean, that's the literally the best time to be really making sure you get, you know, 30 or 40 grams of protein is right after you work out because at that point you really want mTOR, which is the mechanistic target of rapamycin. You want it to turn on, like you yes. want your muscles to rebuild and to, yes. you know, strengthen. You want that. And so one thing that I don't know if it's a pet peeve of yours, but I always get really annoyed when people start talking about mTOR. Oh my gosh, you're going to die younger. You turn that thing on. It's like, no dummy, you turn it on when it's appropriate and you turn it off while you're fasting. Yeah. It's an off and an on. You need it. You need yeah. mTOR. And I actually have not seen any high quality study ever that's been done looking specifically at mTOR and being turned on and off by protein that makes me even the tiniest bit worried about dying younger. I just haven't seen it. The studies are, are poor quality. They're epidemiological. They're not randomized. They're, there's no good data that says that eating protein is going to make you die younger. That's just silly. What, do you, yeah. what are your thoughts? Yeah. You know, it, it Here's again, we always have to go back and ask like, what, what does the body want? And, and if you look at everything in the body, it waxes and wanes. So our nervous system, we have the sympathetic that gives us energy and the parasympathetic that rests, that rests us. You know, we've got, we are supposed to be awake during the day and sleep at night. There's an opposite to everything. So if all we're doing is stimulating mTOR all day long, yeah, not good. Yeah. But if we pair states of autophagy with that, there is a wax and wane that should happen. And I think it, we get we get dogmatic. We think, oh, fasting's good. Let me do more of it. <laughs> oh, uh, a vegan diet's good. Let me eat that all day. No, you're supposed to be in and out. If we look at metabolic flexibility, it's like you're supposed to be operating from your sugar burner system at one point, and then you're supposed to go into your fat burner and your body should be able to switch in and out. And the minute it can't switch in and out, now, you know, disease is building. So it, it, I think we have to honor, we, we've lost sight of what our bodies need and they need rhythm and, and, and those cycles. Oh, rhythm is my favorite thing to talk about. And I, I'm sure you're familiar with the work of uh, Dr. Panda out of the Salk Institute. Oh, yeah. He was one of the first guys to really shed light on this whole circadian rhythm yes. with respect to not only the light and dark, but just the timing of food. He said, basically the two biggest triggers to your body's circadian rhythm are basically the light and dark cycle that, you know, you get out in the morning, the best thing you do for your sleep at night is you just see the natural light. You have the sun hit your eyes. It hits those photoreceptors there. And it, it sets the tone for a great night's sleep in the morning. Like who knew, right? But the other biggest trigger is the food is yeah. the timing of your food. And they, yeah. he, he did the original work on this. I think it was 2012 or something where he took the mice that gave them the exact same calorie diet, the exact same macronutrient profile. Everything was identical except the timing of when they were eating. One group of mice got to eat ad lib, which is whenever the heck they wanted. The other group had like an eight hour feeding window. And guess what? The group that ate whenever they wanted, that never gave their body a rest, never got into autophagy. Yep. They got overweight. They got hepatic inflammation. They got metabolic disease, insulin yep. resistance, all of those things, inflammation, all of the markers went up and those that had the exact same calories, but they had the window narrowed to, I think it was eight hours in this particular study. They basically had none of that. They were about 36% less heavy. They didn't have the hepatic inflammation. They didn't have the insulin resistance. And it was the same dang food, the same amount of food. All of it was the same, but the trigger was different. The trigger was different because they were doing the cycle. They had the autophagy, then they had the rebuilding as they ate and they, they went back and forth. So the cyclical nature, the rhythm, oh, yeah. you hit the nail on the head there. On that one, what's really interesting is if you look at it hormonally, what you're doing is you're mapping your food to melatonin. So when melatonin goes high, you insulin, you become more insulin resistant. So, and, and there's a reason for that. The body is going to prepare itself for sleep and for wake. So if all of a sudden at, you know, a meal you eat at nine o'clock at night, 
is going to be stored more like fat. It's going to mess mm -hmm. up more of your sleep. That same meal, that same amount of meal, eat, if you eat that at five, is going to have a totally different experience in your body because of the presence or absence of melatonin. I, I literally have like thought recently that I think part of why we have an obesity problem is because we've been talking about food as the source of the problem. And I'm not dismissing that yeah. food isn't the source, but we need to start by A, figuring out our natural rhythm of when to eat that works for not just us, but also our hormones. And then once we get the timing right, now we can have the discussion about the quality. But we do it opposite. We start with the quality. Mm. Oh, I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going on this diet and that diet and this diet. And we don't even think about the timing of when we eat all this stuff. Yeah, no, couldn't couldn't agree more. That rhythm is so important. And I, I I wanted to ask you one other thing. I'm sorry if I jump back a little bit. When we were talking about like the fasted workout and and doing also prolonged fasts, um, one of the things that I've had people question, especially the guys out there, and I, I know um, the women have the same concern, is if they fast for I don't know what the magic number is, but a certain length of time. And they're working out really hard. The concern is that they may lose some muscle, especially with, you know, the prolonged fasting yeah. 24, 36, 72 hours. Can you speak to that a little bit? And how can we yeah. sort of maybe not have any muscle loss during those yeah. prolonged fasts? So this is one of my favorite questions because what the longer you fast, the more your body's going to go after stored sugar. And it stores sugar in three places, liver, fat, and muscles. Muscle, yeah. So when you go into a prolonged fast, you're going to feel like there was muscle shrinkage. You're going to feel like, oh my God, my muscles were not, or have, have gotten smaller. But all your muscles have done in that temporary period of time is gotten rid of the senescent cells, gotten rid of the glucose, gotten rid of what doesn't serve you. So the most important thing, it depends on how long you're fasting, is once you go back into food, we're back at protein. Are you powering up on protein? Are you now stimulating mTOR? If you go into three days of autophagy, then you better make sure that when you come out of that, that there's some mTOR stimulation. Um, but what a lot of people do, especially in the fasting world, is that they get so excited about how they feel and they don't, when they go back into food, they kind of tiptoe back into food and, or maybe their calorie counters, they don't use food as a therapeutic tool for stimulating mTOR so they can build muscle. So it, yeah. it's all, it's temporary, but, but people will see it, you know, an article saying that, oh my God, stimulating autophagy, stimulating fasting kills your muscle. No, your muscle is repairing. Just like when you go to the gym and you break your muscle down by lifting weights, what's going to happen on the other side of that is going to build itself back up. So when you come out of that fast, go back into protein, go back and build it back up just like you do at the gym. Yeah, no, that's uh, breaking the fast with the right kind of foods, which are, you know, yeah. high quality protein, primarily foods are so critical. And I think Sometimes people, especially that are a little bit more novice to the fasting, you know, maybe they, they crush their first 24 hour fast and they're like, oh my gosh, I just want to eat whatever's in front of me. And I just want to go yeah. crazy. And, you know, obviously that's not what we want to do. Maybe just speak quickly to that, uh, how we should be really breaking our fast, especially if we do a little bit of a longer one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so funny you ask that because, uh, with fast, like a girl, that was like my number one requirement. When Hay House bought the book, I was like, all I care about is we have one chapter on breaking a fast because <laughs> people are not breaking their fasts. Right. Yeah. And so here's what I'll tell you. There are three ways to break your fast. One is with protein. We talked about that. Make sure it's clean. Make sure you're getting 30 grams in that first meal so that you stimulate those amino receptor sites. The second one is you can break it with what I call the three Ps. And the three Ps are polyphenol, probiotic, and prebiotic foods. These are going to be your fermented yogurts. Your, um, you can do like, I, I sometimes do a shake with some kefir in there and then maybe throw in some amino acid powder or collagen powder. Um, but you, but you definitely want to, if, uh, polyphenol foods are like olives and chocolate. Yes. You can break your fast with good chocolate, <laughs> not Hershey's chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, um, even a salad, all the vegetables are great and put some hemp seeds and chia seeds on it because what you're doing with those three 
three P's is that you're feeding the microbiome. When you fast, you're killing the microbiome and you want to do that. You are changing the gut environment. You are getting rid of the bad bacteria, but you're also can get rid of some of the good. So if you know that you want to focus on gut health, then come in with those three P's. And we put a bunch of recipes and stuff in the new book because people get lost because the lists are long. And then the last one is fat. So we'll have people break their fast with fat. If let's say they want to go 48 hours and it's like four o'clock, they're at like, let's say they're at like the 20 hour mark and they're like, oh God, I'm not going to be able to go 48 hours. You have them eat some fat, fat, have them do an avocado, have them do uh, bone broth, which is protein and fat. And you'll see that you can go fast a little bit longer. Hey, do you guys know what I'm really loving these days? I got this epic new device. It's called Lumen, L-U-M-E-N. It's a metabolic tracker. You remember how I've always said we want a flexible metabolism, you know, one that can operate both on fats as well as carbohydrates and be able to use them for energy in the most effective and efficient way. Well, this device does the job. It tells you where you are with respect to your metabolism. And if you're on your way to metabolic flexibility, it's super, super easy. It doesn't involve any peeing in a cup or any needle sticks, poking yourself, checking blood, none of that. All you have to do is put your lips around it and do a couple of breaths. It's that dang simple. And it really helps you hack your metabolism, gives you all the information that you need and coupled with the app, it provides you with meal plans and dietary advice and things. It's just really epic. I'm really loving it. It's L-U-M-E-N. And if you want to check it out, you can get a discount of 50 bucks if you sign up for a device with my code D-R-T-H. All this will be in the show notes, but check it out, lumen.me. It's an epic metabolic hacking device, which I'm using and I'm loving, and I hope you'll check it out too. And with my discount code of D-R-T-H, you can get 50 bucks off. So check it out. Check out your Lumen. All right. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it'll still keep you into that sort of uh, ketosis, which we get into when we fast a certain period of time. It's starvation ketosis in the beginning. And, you know, we, we can sort of mimic that, right, with yeah. a little bit of fat there. And, you know, the, I don't know what your thoughts are on like the, the coffees with, you know, the, the, the grass fed butter in them or the MCT oils. What? Quickly, yeah. what's your thoughts on that? Well, I so here's what I would say on that is um, coffee can stimulate, good coffee, good clean coffee can stimulate, yeah. can, let's just make sure we're clear on that, can stimulate autophagy. So that's kind of cool in your fasting window. If you put MCT oil in that black coffee, now MCT oil can move you over into the fat burner system a little mm. bit more and make you ketones. So you ketones will go up into the brain and turn off hunger. So now you're able to fast a little longer. Yeah. Now, once you put cream in there, now we it's going to be different for everybody. Some people, if they put a heavy whipping cream in there, um, it's going to, it's fat. It'll stabilize their blood sugar. It'll kill hunger and they'll stay in a fasted state. Some, it depends on the microbiome. The microbiome determines what it does with that food. So it, some people that's really great. Some people it pulls them out. So you really have to test to, to see if it works right for you. Get like a blood sugar reader, take a reading of your blood sugar, have your favorite coffee, and then half an hour, take another blood sugar reader reading did those two readings, are they this close to the same? If they're not, if that yeah. second reading, it's gone up, it's probably pulled you out of a fasted state. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think when, when you see that, you can kind of almost intuit or assume that you're not really getting the full benefit of the autophagy. If you're spiking your, your sugar a little bit because you threw in some cream and your body didn't didn't respond to that well, you know, maybe that wasn't the best option for you. So I think you got to experiment. I, I really think that's great. And you mentioned, you know, you don't want to be going out to the normal coffee houses that we think yeah. of when we think of coffee, yeah. because that stuff is probably the most pesticide laden of almost oh. any that's yeah. available, right? Yeah. <laughs> you got to yeah. be careful. And like, if you're going to put almond milk in oat milk, oat milk is oh, so popular not, oh, right oh, now. Oh. No, like you are, Never. that is going to spike your blood sugar. That is not going to help a fasted coffee. Yeah. I'm not in, you know, what, when I did a CGM a while back, that was one of the biggest surprises is even with steel cut oats, my sugar went, Hurp. I was like, what the heck? I haven't eaten oatmeal since. I just can't even look at it the same way. Even, yep. you know, it's just, even the whole steel cut, the real gritty stuff. I can't even do that. It just spikes yep. my sugar. So I would never drink oat milk. And people I think are surprised 
because I think, oh, it's natural. It's supposed to be good. It's, that thing will raise your blood sugar, your insulin. Okay. And oh my gosh, stay away from that stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah. Amen to that. A thousand percent agree. Oh man. So we're wrapping up here and, and I think this will be super brief because when a woman, we want to round out the whole discussion with menopause, my, my humble opinion and my, my experience has been, it's almost easier, right? Because they yes. don't have all these cyclical fluctuations. So maybe just speak to the menopause period and how you sort of coach people through the fasting yeah. and, and whatnot. So we still have to thank you for asking that question. Cause I get all, all the menopausal women are like, okay, we get it, but we need to also, how do we do it? Because we yeah. don't have a cycle to time it to. So we go back to that idea. You still have three hormones to think about you and, and progesterone is going to continue to go down as your, as life goes on. So we want to make sure that you're getting the benefits of fasting. Um, estrogen, for example, when you go through the menopausal experience, as estrogen goes down, you become more insulin resistant. So yeah. fasting is going to shine for menopausal women. But then you don't want to fast all the time because you have to still think about progesterone. She's also declining. So you got to step out of fasting periodically. And there's two ways you can do that. First is what I call a five, one, 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 five days a week, practice intermittent fasting, 13 to 15 hours. That that's fabulous for the menopausal woman. One day a week, let's stretch your fast. If you can get to 24 hours, that's amazing because we can start to repair the gut and the gut breaks these hormones down. And then one day a week, no fasting, like, and, and actually carb loading. If you're going to do, you know, more of a keto approach on those other days, that one day you have to not fast. So it, and then in the new book, I've got a 30 day reset that women who are uh, post-menopausal, they can just go through three to 30 days and they'll hit all the different levels. Um, but yeah, it's they, a lot of times what I hear is people say, well, um, post-menopausal women can fast like men. And I'm like, yeah, ish. 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 Yeah. Ish. <laughs> they, <laughs> so. they don't have the same cyclical fluctuations, but you know, even when I'm, I'm counseling and recommending to men with respect to their fasting, I also say, don't do it every single day. Always. You got to mix it up. Like you got to yeah. take a day off here and there because your body actually is really, really smart. We for millennia, were trying to stay alive. We were trying to survive when there was no yeah. food around. So That's if right. we go too many days in a row and we never break it up, our body's going to say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to try to hold on to those calories, whether it be the fats or the carbs, whatever we ate, hold on to them much more tight. And it's going to be even harder, especially if you want to have some sort of weight loss aspect, you're going to stall. You need to yep. mix it up. You need to keep yep. your body kind of on its toes, so to speak, and stay flexible. And so men or women, it's still, you need to mix it up. So yep. I would agree with that. And, and you know, that, that concept right there was what actually exploded my YouTube channel because what happened was so many people read Jason Fung's book, The Obesity mm -hmm. Code, which is a brilliant book. Yeah. And they became fasting fanatics. They lost Die tons hard. of weight. Oh. Yeah, this is the O matters. They were like <laughs> only eating one meal a day and it worked for a moment. For and a while, then, yeah. all, then they got stuck and all the symptoms for women, it was losing their cycle, hair falling out, thyroid, having problems. And for the men, it was like, Hey, wait, I'm not losing weight anymore. So it, to your point, feast, famine, cycling, that's what our human body was made for. It wasn't made to eat all day. It wasn't made to fast all the time. We're back at, at the cycle. It's gotta yeah. be rhythmic. <laughs> Rhythmic. Oh my yeah. gosh. So, so much here. Well, I, I, I appreciate you so much. I, oh, you've just you. been amazing. Any parting thoughts? And then of course, how can we reach out to you? How can our viewers and listeners get a hold of your new book and all your stuff that you're putting out to the world? Cause there's Thank so much you. awesomeness coming out. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you know, my, my parting thoughts are really, I just want to get the world fasting. I think it is, it, it's free and it's time efficient. And so those are the two biggest barriers are money and time are the biggest barriers to health. So, and you can accomplish with fasting. I mean, I've seen people accomplish things that met, they're trying to use medication to accomplish. So I hope everybody tries that. And yeah, fast like a girl, you know, it, I'm so excited to get it out to the world. And I've actually decided, I just read the audio book last week and the two sound engineers in the studio were like super fascinated. And I walked away and I thought, 
shoot, I think this is a book for men too, because I have all the things about breaking your fast and all the front sections. So really cool. But you can go to fastlikeagirl.com or you can just go to my website and everything's there. And so you read your own audiobook? Yes. Awesome. Yes. That's Great. that's my goal. My my book's really? coming out in January and I want to read my book as well because I just figure why not? I mean, you're yeah. you're not going to find anybody else as enthusiastic as yeah. you know, well versed in the stuff. Wow. Thanks thanks for doing that cuz not yeah. enough people not enough people do it. Let's be it's, honest. I mean. <laughs> yeah, thank you for saying that because it's a daunting task. 83,000 words I got to read in 3 days, 8 hours a day. And you're reading your own writing, you know, like you try not to edit yourself and you're not trying to freak out that there's already the layouts already been done and there's nothing you can do to change it at this moment. So it's a very humbling experience, but it is, you know, to your point, it's like, this is my information and I want it to come from me. So what, what's your, what's your book on? I'm excited to hear about your book. Yeah. My book is uh, called preventable five powerful practices to avoid disease and build unshakable health. And so oh. I just kind of break down the, what I feel like are the most uh, effective levers that we can use in our life. And they're basically simple, free things for the most part. And I, yeah. I get, I get kind of nerdy. I, I, I'm like you, I love the science. I love yeah. to go deep and it's, yeah, I can't wait to get it out there. It's going to be out in January. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, I'll have to have you on my podcast and I'll, I'll, we can talk about it. I love the name preventable. It's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Dr. Minnie, you've just been such a gift. Thank you so much for being here today. I'll post up yeah. all your links in the show notes. It's been a lot of fun and wow, Agreed. what a fire hose of just information that we got. And I hope everybody will reach out to you, follow you, get your book, of course, fast, like a girl. What a cool, cool title. Anyway, that's but it's for dudes too. I'm going to say that everything yeah. you said today can also be applied in some way, shape or form to the guys out there. So yeah. all the gals out there, get your dudes to also fast. It's yeah. so dang important. You know, if they ever talk about low T dude, get them fasting right. Come on like, hello. Right. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you know what I find I'm finding is that when I'm talking about the prim principles of fast, like a girl, men are really appreciating it because they're understanding their, the women in their lives. So it's really interesting. I didn't have this intention with the book, but um, uh, the, it is a manual for women, but there's so much science and so much application of fasting in it for men as well. And they're going to learn about the women in their lives, which is really cool. It's priceless. It's truly priceless. I think that that understanding. So thank you for getting out there to the world. I hope everybody gets it. And uh, thanks for being here. And we'll hope to see you again soon. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, aloha. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss out on any future episode. And I'd love to hear your comments and feedback. If there's any topic you'd love to hear about, you're dying to know, burning questions, please comment below and let me know what future topics are of interest to you. Disclaimer, nothing in this video is medical advice. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes only.